What's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the Renewable Energy Smart Pod. I'm your host, Sean McMahon, and today we've got a real treat in store for you. Most episodes of this show feature experts from the renewable energy sector who talk about what's going on in the industry from a business to business perspective. But today, we're going to pivot away from that B2B focus and talk about things on a much more consumer level. After all, while most of the listeners of this podcast might work in renewables, all of the listeners of this podcast are energy consumers. And let's be honest, even some of the most die-hard members of the renewables industry probably have at least one or two things about their home that they wish were more sustainable. With that in mind, Matt Farrell is going to join me in a minute to outline various ways everyday people can embrace cost-saving strategies that also make their homes more resilient and more sustainable. Matt is the creator of Undecided with Matt Farrell, where he has amassed more than 1 million subscribers on YouTube by applying his technology-focused eye to all things sustainability. Matt is also the co-host of the Still To Be Determined podcast. He tests smart and sustainable technology solutions and often offers advice to viewers and listeners who, just like you and me, might need a wee bit of help making decisions about which solutions are the best for their home. Matt and I are going to touch on batteries, solar panels, weatherization, and various other topics, including, yes, even the Inflation Reduction Act. Matt's a real straight shooter, so I think you'll appreciate hearing what he has to say. Looking ahead at the schedule for this podcast, in the coming weeks, we'll be joined by Casey Peters from Pivot Energy. Casey is going to walk us through what's cooking these days in the community solar sector. We'll also be joined by Jill Blickstein, the Vice President of Sustainability at American Airlines. Jill will update us on the latest advancements in sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen electric zero emission aviation, and numerous other initiatives that American is undertaking to reduce its carbon footprint. Those should be some great conversations, so I hope you look forward to hearing from Casey and Jill as much as I do. But for now, let's kick off my chat with Matt Farrell about how you can save money and make your home more sustainable. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. My guest is Matt Farrell. Matt is the creator of the Still To Be Determined podcast and the popular YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm very good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. I'm really excited to have you on because a lot of the episodes on this podcast are kind of, you know, the corporate lens looking at the renewable space. But every once in a while, I like to bring in someone who's going to kind of tell us, you know, what homeowners or small business owners, you know, look at look at what's going on in this space from that perspective. And obviously someone with your background is perfect for that. I know you have a perfect background for that, but why don't you tell some of our listeners a little bit about what you do? I create videos mainly on YouTube around sustainable technologies and kind of have been documenting my experience with a lot of these technologies like home batteries, going solar, having an electric vehicle, how energy storage is evolving over time, basically looking at all of these kind of sustainable tech advances and how they're impacting us in our daily lives. So it's kind of the whole bread and butter of what I do. All right. And I see you have more than a million subscribers on YouTube. So you must know what you're talking about. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> now, really, I think the perfect guest, because I want to bring someone in here to kind of look at these things from, like I said, the perspective of a homeowner or a small business owner and things like that. Right. So let's tackle the home front first. So what are some of the most sustainable technologies out there that homeowners are adapting? I know we'll delve into things like solar and batteries and things like that, but just what are you seeing overall as some of the most popular trends or what do you get the most questions about, I should say? What I get the most questions about, honestly, is solar and batteries. But outside of that, it comes down to, it's like a slippery slope. Once you go to solar, it's like you start to become finely attuned to where's my electricity use going? Like, how can I optimize my home's energy use? And that's where I think a lot of people are starting to kind of catch on smart thermostats, uh, smart home tech, things along the lines of like smart light switches and outlets and things like that. They can work together to help you understand where your energy use is going inside your home and how to control that in a better way. Because like we have a lot of devices in our homes that are like drawing phantom power constantly. So you have a television set that even when it's off is pulling five watts of power. So it's like having systems that can just turn those off and just stop that phantom drain. Little things like that people are very concerned about. And I see a lot more interest kind of growing around the smart technologies. All right. Well, we'll definitely circle back to some of that stuff, but I, I want to get back to the two things you get the most questions about, solar and batteries. Solar so, and batteries. <laughs> you know, not a surprise. Um, yeah. So what are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to deploying solar at a, at a home or a small business? I would say for homeowners specifically, 
the financing can be really kind of weird. And a lot of people are feel like they're being taken advantage of by shady installers that are coming door to door, knocking on your door, trying to get you to buy their solar panels and have an installation. So it's like my typical recommendation for homeowners is not to do PPAs, is that you should be looking at loans or paying cash. And there's a lot of incentive programs in different states to help you get solar loans or home equity lines of credit and things like that that can help you with that. I recommend that over PPAs mainly because PPAs add a layer of <laughs> complexity when you go to sell your house. Like if you do this and three years later, you're like, oh, now I have to move. It creates problems because the person buying your house either has to sign that PPA to take it over from you, or then you're on the hook for having to get rid of it or have the panels removed. It creates a whole bunch of complication that typically a homeowner will want to avoid. So I'd recommend against that. So we're yeah. talking PPAs. A lot of folks are yeah. new to this. We're talking power purchase agreements, right? Power purchase agreements, yes. Okay, just basically, to, you know, we've got first you, time listeners here on some of yeah, this stuff, right? You, yeah, you you do not own the panels. When it's a PPA, you as the homeowner do not own it. It's a, basically like a utility has basically put panels on your roof, and then you've agreed to buy the electricity at a certain rate from that utility. What makes it very appealing is there's no upfront costs. You don't have to maintain the panels. So if something goes wrong with the panel system, they're on the hook for fixing it. So there's a lot of what look like pros, but it's like, as soon as you kind of peel that back is when I'm like, oh, for a homeowner, it gets kind of dicey after that. If you're talking businesses, that's something completely different. And I think there's a totally different equation when you're talking about PPAs and businesses, but for homeowners, <laughs> I don't recommend it. The other thing that a lot of homeowners fall in the trap of, they get one quote and then they either make a yes or no decision off that one quote, always get multiple quotes, always look up the going rate of the cost per kilowatt of the system. So like if you're getting a nine kilowatt system, you can take the total cost divided by that number and you'll come up with a, it costs $2 and 60 cents per watt for this system. You can then look at that and do an apples to apples comparison across the quotes you're getting. You can look up on Google, just like what is the average cost per watt of solar in my area? And you will find out what that is for if you live in Kentucky or Massachusetts or whatever it is. So you can see if the installer is like gouging you or is in the ballpark or the right place. So it's like, those are things I don't think most people know to do. And so that's for me is the, please do that because you will save so much money if you do that. I've helped so many people <laughs> avoid that one issue. Like they'll show me a quote and I'll do the little math and I'll look up in their area and it's like two to three times the average cost. And it's like, I'll let them know and they go back and find a different installer that comes in at a better rate. And they're like, thank you so much. Cause it could sometimes be tens of thousands of dollars in, in difference. So you've got folks sending you quotes. Yeah. I, I have people reach out to me and send me quotes from time to time saying, could you please take a look at this? It feels a little dicey to me. And so usually when they have that feeling, follow your gut. Cause it's like, it's like, yeah, you, you had every reason to be questioning this quote, but yeah. So you're a friend of the homeowners and maybe not such a friend of some of the installers out there. <laughs> I know. I know. I've actually become friends with many installers. And so it's like, I, I know a lot of reputable installers and it drives them nuts too, is that there are certain companies out there that take advantage. All right. And then in terms of the technology for solar, are there any kind of, you know, we talked about pricing and, you know, what kind of deal structure to have for your home or your business, but are there any technologies out there that you highly recommend or say, Hey, st stay away from this or Hey, maybe wait and let it develop more. There's a lot of buzz around perovskites, which really aren't a thing yet. Perovskite solar panels. If you hear people telling you to wait for perovskites, do not wait. Those are still, <laughs> they still have some baking in the oven to do. I think your standard panel, if you're buying from any kind of reputable company like REC or QCell, there, there's these different solar cell technologies that have good warranties, 25 year warranties. If you go with any of those, you're going to be good. If you're trying to save money, oftentimes you're getting a lower quality cell that might only last 10, 15 years. So you need to do those equations and understand that why one panel might cost half of another one comes down to this may need to be replaced in 15 years and this one will last you 30 plus. So you need to make sure that you're looking at the warranties. But for me, it's like QCell and REC tend to be kind of like that middle to top tier of what you would want to look for. Okay. You mentioned you also get a lot of questions about batteries. So yeah. let's kind of take that same tactic. What are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to batteries? Batteries are dicey because they're still very expensive for homes right now. And it really depends on where you live. It's like a hyper-local decision because if you have cheap electricity rates and there aren't good incentive packages in your area, a battery is just not going to make sense. But if you live in areas like Massachusetts, where I do, or California, um, and there, if time of use rates where you 
the electricity rate is really expensive during the day and really cheap overnight. If you have those kind of options, that's when batteries can really start to kind of sing and really kind of save you money. In addition to just giving you that uh, level of comfort, if there's an outage, you're going to have, it's a basically a backup generator. So it will carry you through the outage. So for me, when I, when people ask me, should I get a battery or not? The first question I'm always asking is, where do you live? Because that's like, I have to understand, like, are you talking about like you live in Florida or do you live in California? Are there wildfires? Do you have, do you live in Vermont and get a lot of power outages over the winter time? There's so many different things you have to take into the calculation. For me, that's the first thing I talk about. After that, it really comes down to, <laughs> it's maybe controversial, but don't buy into the marketing hype or the brand names that you may think of, like the Tesla Powerwalls. I have a Tesla Powerwall. It's great. I have nothing against it, but they tend to be more on the pricey side. And there are cheaper options that you can get that will work just as well as a Tesla Powerwall. There's nothing special about their technology that makes it a better battery than another one. It's You have to look at the underlying chemistries. I don't know how detailed we want to get here, but most of these batteries are either, they're called NMC, nickel manganese cobalt batteries, or they're lithium iron batteries, LFP batteries. Those are your two main options for home batteries. LFP tends to be the better for home use because it has a higher cycle life. Technically, it's a slightly safer battery, so it will last you a longer amount of time than an NMC battery will. And right now, Powerwalls are NMC and other battery companies like Enphase, the Sonin Eco batteries, those are LFP. And so for me, it's like if I was going to recommend somebody to battery, look at LFP batteries and then just kind of shop around and see what's the best option for you in your area. And so you mentioned a lot of the conversation starts with where do you live, which I think also yeah. answers the question is why they want to get it. Some folks wanted to just lower their monthly bills. Other folks, like you say, got wildfires and power outages and they, you know, they want to keep the lights on and keep the refrigerator running for, you know, as long as they can. So does the type of battery kind of determine your answer on those questions? Like these are better for just a re from a resiliency perspective and these are better from, uh, you know, regular use and, and lowering costs. I think that would come down to how big of a battery you get. So like if your goal is, I just want to make sure that, you know, we get power outages in the winter time that, you know, maybe last half a day. Okay. You don't need a massive battery pack. Just get an LFP battery that may be, you know, like a 10 kilowatt hour system and that will be all you need. Uh, or somebody that's like, I want to go off grid. I want to be as self-sufficient as I can understanding how much energy they use and saying, okay, you might want a 20 kilowatt hour system or a 30 kilowatt hour system. A again, I'm always, almost always recommending an LFP over an NMC just because of that cycle life equation. So it's like cost wise, they're not that different. So it's like a uh, Tesla Powerwall versus the N phase um, IQ system. It's kind of six of one, half a dozen the other <laughs> cost wise. So it just comes down to what kind of energy output you need. That's the other factor that we haven't talked about. Cause like not all batteries are created equal. Like if you're running your stove, you're charging an EV, you're doing all this stuff at once, how much energy it can output at once is an important factor as well. It's not just how much energy it can store, but how much can it deliver at once so that if your air conditioning kicks on, it doesn't trip a, a circuit and shut the battery off. <laughs> you don't want that either. Yeah. So let's dive into that. So, I mean, obviously there are some folks who, like you said, you got an EV going, they got a a larger square foot house. We'll just say, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to draw the demarcation line of what's big and what's small these days, but you know, <laughs> a McMansion or something like that. But you know, how, how do you tackle, or excuse me, how should the homeowners tackle something like that? Like just identifying, okay, I got all these appliances, you know, a car, maybe two cars. Um, yeah. how do you help them sort through all that? The easy, well, I say easy in gigantic air quotes, it would be like, you just want to kind of create a list of all the main things in your home, like your HVAC system, your stove, your dishwasher, your, you know, the things that draw a lot of power, just come up with a list of all the main things. And then just you find the spec sheets. And so you know how much wattage they pull just based on the spec sheets. And you can just do some back of the neck math and then go, oh, there's a total of, you know, 5,000 watts. So it's five kilowatt draw. If I had all these things on at once, that kind of gives you a nice baseline. The next step up is what I was talking about before, about how a lot of people like are concerned about like, well, how much energy am I actually using? If you have smart outlets, a lot of these smart outlets track how much energy you're using. You can buy cheap energy meters online from Amazon for like 25 bucks where you just plug it into the outlet and plug the thing you want to track into it. And it will show you how much wattage it's pulling. If you want to get really detailed, you could actually put that on your you know, electric dryer and see exactly how much energy it pulls when you're running it. So if you kind of get this back of the nap and math understanding of like, 
my home is typically on a heavy load pulling four or five, six, seven thousand kilowatts, you'll then understand what you need to do for a battery. So it's like you'd want a battery that can achieve at least 6,000, 7,000 kilowatts continuous output with a, a, a spike of 10,000 because most of these batteries can handle a short spike to a higher load. So if the air conditioning kicks on, it has a huge spike of energy and then it drops down to what it's going to run at. You just want to make sure that you can handle those spikes and uh, just look at the spec sheets on the batteries and what you have in your home. I got to tell you, Matt, I'm I'm really grateful that you're kind of teaching folks how to tabulate <laughs> all the watts they use in their house because because I've mentioned this on a few episodes in the past on my soapbox here. Like, I don't think most people speak watts. No, I really think like and I, that's in the context of, you know, these massive renewable energy projects like, oh, it's this solar farm or wind farm is going to generate a bunch of megawatts. And I'm like, people don't know what that means. Like they drive by, a win, you know, a wind turbine out there in the field and they have no idea like how many homes yeah. that one turbine powers. So yeah. getting back to your recommendation, like figure out how much you need. It kind of, you know, ex- educates them on how to speak the language a little bit. So yeah, I love the fact, I love that you're doing that. So, you know, following on that conversation, you know, we're all trying to figure out ways to increase energy efficiency, you know, lose, use less power, or, you know, try to design the net zero house. So mm-hmm. what's some of the low hanging fruit there for homeowners? In addition to stuff we've already mentioned, right. You know, kind of the outlets that measure, you know, the TV pull and watch things like that. Is there anything else that just in two or three moves, a homeowner could really see results in terms of reducing their costs? Oh, weatherization. That's like number one. Like you should get an energy audit, somebody to come out, help kind of audit your house, take a look at how airtight your house is. If the insulation needs to be updated, because, you know, insulation in your attic, if you have blown in an insulation, it can settle, it can blow out. Um, it may not be enough and I may, may not be deep enough. So you might just need to have some additional insulation blown in. Uh, my house, I had this done on my house. The current house is I had a energy audit done. They added, I think it was like about a foot of blown in insulation. They re blew new insulation into the exterior walls. And it was covered by a Massachusetts program that covered most of the cost. So for me, out of pocket, it didn't cost me much. And it had a huge impact on how much <laughs> heating and air conditioning we needed to do to keep our house comfortable inside. So not only did it save us money, but it made our house more comfortable. So it's like, it's kind of a win win on, b- on both fronts. So definitely get an energy audit and get some weatherization updates done to your house. Any other low-hanging fruit? Smart thermostats, things like that. They can be a very cheap and effective way just to kind of like a DIY project. It's like you don't need a professional to come in and change your thermostat. You can do it yourself. It's it's pretty easy to do. It's a simple upgrade. They're affordable now. And sometimes even utilities will give you rebates on the cost of a smart thermostat. So it's like there's also programs like um, my Ecobee is enrolled in a local program called Connected Solutions. So the utility during peak times where they're trying to shave electricity costs off the grid, they'll just like, it's fascinating to watch it happen and over the summer. It's like they will crank up my air conditioning in the middle of the day, leading a couple hours leading up to the peak demand, which usually happens around dinner time. So like three o'clock in the afternoon, my air conditioning will crank up, gets the house really nice and cold, and then the system shuts off. And so then during the peak shaving moment, which is like maybe six to seven o'clock, my house is just slowly warming back up. And by the time the peak demand is over, my house may be up to like 76 degrees, 78 degrees, and the air conditioning kicks back on again. And there's rewards for these kind of programs. Not only does it save you money, but sometimes they'll give you money back. Like the utility will give you at the end of the this, this summer, will give you a small check or a gift card or something like that. So easy ways to kind of save a little money. Very simple. Alrighty. So now on the policy front, obviously Mm -hmm. the the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, that thing is chock full of all kinds of incentives and tax incentives for various technologies that can be deployed in a home. And I was joking earlier, I'm not sure if a lot of people speak what, I'm not sure if more or fewer people speak taxes (laughs) or specifically (laughs) specifically tax incentives. So, you know, you're hearing there's incentives for heat pumps and solar and batteries and things like that. What did you think of all those incentives? And if you're a homeowner, how should you prioritize these things if you've got budget limitations? I love the incentives that they put in the IRA. It's like it, they're hitting all the right notes. When when it came out, I was very impressed with what was in there. I was also very impressed with how they had taken, not all people were going to like this, but they take income into account. So like the more income, household income you have, the less of a rebate you'll see because they're trying to make it equitable based on you know how much money you make every year. I'm a big fan of that as well, because oftentimes these programs 
only help the people who are wealthy in the first place. It's nice to have programs that are going to help as many people as they possibly can. It covers everything from heat pumps to, as you mentioned, uh, electrification of your house because some of these things are going to take more electricity in your home. So it's making sure that your home can handle all the electricity needs it's going to need all these kind of rebates. It makes your head spin how much is in there. And then even when you look at, oh, it's a heat pumps. Well, it's no, it's actually how much I'm going to get on a heat pump. Oh, well, it's how much do you make? And it's like, there's all these different ways to calculate it, which makes it difficult. But if you're going at this and you're trying to kind of see how you should prioritize things, it's kind of similar to what we just talked about. I would prioritize the energy audit and the weatherization because that's part of the IRA is they will help homes improve their efficiency. That's where I would start because that's like the lowest hanging fruit, biggest bang for your buck. That's where you're going to go. And then after that, I'd be looking at things like hot water heaters. If your water heater is kind of old, it might be a year or two away from being needing to be replaced. I'd be looking at the hot water heaters. Heat pump water heaters are fantastic. Um, and then the heat pump systems for your home, for the HVAC system, would be the next place I'd be tackling. It's kind of like the way I'm looking at it is kind of like the return on investment. It's like, what's the biggest bang for your buck? And it's like the more expensive the ticket of the item is the lower on my list. So it's like the cheapest stuff is the weatherization. The next most expensive item would be the heat pumps, which would be the next place to hit. And then the last place I'd be looking at would be solar and home batteries. Home batteries would be the last on the list. Um, but I'm a huge fan of solar, a massive fan of solar. I would still put it down the list because it is such a upfront expensive system to put in place where the other ones are going to give you immediate benefit for a lot less money. Yeah. And you mentioned the upfront costs with solar. You know, a lot of businesses are being approached about community solar. What yeah. do you know about that? And what's your, what's your take on the benefits or the drawbacks of those kinds of programs? I'm actually a big fan of community solar projects, um, mainly because a lot of times somebody can't afford to put solar on their home or they live in a multifamily home and they have no control. They rent, they can't put solar on their house. What do they do? They want to get solar, but they can't. And so for me, community solar answers that question because it puts some of the control in your hands of, I want to get clean energy. I want to save a little money on my, my bill. How do I do that? And community solar answers that question. Depending on, this is one of those, this is the wild west when it comes, comes to solar. Each project is handled differently. So you kind of have to be wary when you go in to understand, are there early cancellation fees when you're going into it? Because that could be a potential con where you're you're locked in for a certain number of years. And if you cancel early, there's some kind of like, you know, 500 bucks for early cancellation. So you want to make sure that there's no early cancellation fees, that the rates that you're going to get are, are competitive and are going to save you money. But if you kind of do the basic due diligence, community solar is a fantastic option for, I would say, the majority of people in the United States. You're obviously someone who's pretty tech savvy, uh, specifically when it comes to all these energy efficiency things. So yeah. um, we've talked about a lot of things that exist now, but yeah. are there any technologies out there on the horizon that you've read into that are maybe being developed that really got you excited? Oh yeah. It wants, it's kind of the home energy front. Again, I don't know if you've ever heard of flow batteries, redox flow batteries, but they're typically batteries that are meant for grid scale storage. Like when you, you, we read news articles about flow batteries, it's typically like, oh, they're building this massive flow battery installation in China. They're building one out in California somewhere. It's a very new technology even for the grid, but it's a battery system that will last decades and is going to be competitively priced. There's a company that's working on a model that will be built for homes. It's about the size of a refrigerator. It would give you gobs of energy storage and it's a system that would last you 30 years. So it's like, here's a battery storage system that will last as long as the solar panels that you put on your roof. So if you're getting solar panels and one of these flow batteries, it's like, it's like a lifetime system. So it's, that's a technology that I'm really keeping my eye on. It's not on the market yet, but it's very, I've talked to one of the companies that's working on it and they have a model ready to go. There's just some hurdles they have to get through. So it sounds like it's going to be a system that will start to hit the market in the next two or three years. That's great. So residential flow batteries, because a couple of months ago, we talked to Hugh McDermott from ESS and their mm -hmm. main line of business is, is, like you said, utility scale and kind of large, large commercial operations. But I'm going to have to look in the residential ones, the size of a refrigerator, you say, I'll yeah. power, my whole, power my whole place. Yeah. I did not think that was going to be possible. And when I talked to this company and they showed me what they were doing, I was like, oh my, that's kind of a mind blowing thing. I did not know that was going to happen. That's the part that bothers me about batteries today is they're too expensive and they don't last long enough but there are technologies on the way that are going to solve that problem. They'll be cheaper and they'll last you decades, which is what we need.
Okay. And now, you know, one of the things I like to do on this show is I ask guests for their bold predictions. We've already talked about those new technologies looking forward to, but what are some of the new technologies you think will be commonplace in the next five to 10 years? You know, be it utility size that we're all kind of benefiting from or residential scale where it's just individual folks can just one day go to their local, uh, I don't know, Lowe's or Home Depot and bring it home. (laughs) I think it's going to be energy storage for homes. Honestly, it's like right now it's too expensive, but there are so many systems coming on market that are modular that will be DIY friendly that you could go to your local Walmart and pick something up and just slap it in your garage next to your electric panel and hook it in. Those are coming. That kind of plug and play (laughs) affordable battery tech is going to become commonplace along with what I think is like virtual power plant systems for the grid, where if every home has a battery in it and the utility is able to tap into that mass group of batteries and use them as like one giant battery, it's going to really, really kind of make the grid sing. And it's going to really kind of unlock a lot of possibility, not just for us as homeowners, but for the community as well. For me, that's kind of what I think is the 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 big thing that hopefully plays out over the next decade. And one of the questions I want to ask you was about EV charging. Obviously, oh. we're seeing we're seeing more and more EVs out on the road. Is that technology kind of just where it's going to be for the next five to ten years, or do you think there might be game changers coming along uh, in that market? It's a good question. I think it's kind of where it is for the time being. There's kind of like a <laughs> the. The more kilowatts you're pumping through that cable, the hotter that cable is going to get. And so it's like there's it's only going to get so fast before at some point it just melts itself. So it's like there's I don't think there's like a huge game changing thing that's going to happen in the next five years for that. I just hope the infrastructure gets built out because right now it is depending if you have a Tesla, it's a pretty good experience. If you don't have a Tesla, it's kind of a crapshoot. So it's like I'm really hoping that the infrastructure kind of matures over the next few years to make it kind of ubiquitous and easy to charge no matter what car you have. Okay, Matt. Well, hey, thank you very much for your time today. It sounds like you're also helping a lot of homeowners out there separate the signal from the noise when it comes to building a more efficient home. So appreciate all your insights. I appreciate you having me on. It was a lot of fun. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and colleagues and be sure to follow us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at Renewables Pod. And if you'd like a daily dose of renewable news delivered to your inbox, head to smartbrief.com and sign up for the Renewable Energy Smart Brief. The Renewable Energy Smart Pod is a production of Smart Brief, a future company.